Uh, Professor Ma asked if we could do something that was very much focused on what happens at the level of the learner in the university. Uh, and as a provost, I'm not qualified to talk about that. So with me is a very senior professor from the Faculty of Education, Mike Carbonero. He has for many years been responsible for leading the university's integration of technology into the curriculum. And he's the provost senior advisor on technology across the academy. And we're happy to say that our talk, not knowing this, but we seem to be following virtually all of your advice. So this is good. Uh, my part, there's two parts to MOOCs in a big public university. One is the business model that allows a MOOC to be justified within the financial structures of the institution. I will say four things about that and then turn it over to Mike who will take us through an experiment that we are working through at the University of Alberta that integrates the MOOC in the classroom in an interactive way. We call it blended learning. It's not unique to us, but it's a term that you might hear more about. A little bit of background, Canada has no national ministry of education of any sort. As a result, we are a loose agglomeration of provincial systems, and within the provincial systems there is very little coordination as well. So we have about 100 universities, each university pretty much does their own thing within some pretty rough guidelines around tuition. This is important because in Canada we have very little venture capital industry of our own, we usually get our venture capital from the US, which means several things. There is very little venture capital in the MOOC development in Canada, virtually none. There is no federal money in Canada to support the development of MOOCs because we have no federal ministry and we have no federal strategy. And since MOOCs are viewed by provincial politicians as taking care of students over there, there's no provincial money. Bottom line, developing a MOOC in a Canadian public university requires a very careful justification for allocating government grant and student tuition money intended for the traditional form of university activity to a MOOC, okay? Therein comes the provost. So provost, after 10 years with five more to go, sees two possible justifications. Either the MOOC is going to become part of our fundamental program delivery model in which it will be justified on grants and tuition, or the MOOC is a model for managing and profiling the university around the world as was previously mentioned. We have our first MOOC, it's a dinosaur course. Alberta has among the world's best endowment in dinosaur bones and artifacts and everybody loves dinosaurs. And we have a very high profile team of academics doing the, uh, the science of dinosaur remains and things like that. The experiment is underway. Our first course is finishing up. We don't have the financial results. My suspicion is we will see the MOOC not earn its place in our university on the basic business model of program delivery in four credit programming, but we will see the MOOC as part of an overall identity management, reputation management strategy. So with that, and I will happily answer any and all questions, but Professor Ma and Professor uh, Huang in the back, one, another professor from our education faculty, for reasons entirely unclear to me, they thought you would be less interested in what a provost worries about and much more interested in what real live, honest to God professors worry about. So I'm gonna go sit down until the questions come and turn it over to my colleague. Then Carl can answer all the questions. <laughs> So I'm gonna start off talking a little bit about what we did at the University of Alberta to try and bring about change and how we're doing it right now. And um, some of this is gonna follow a little bit from uh, Dr. Childless' presentation about instructional design and how important it is. And I'm really gonna start on this slide here. And one of the most important things you have to do when you're looking at Bringing digital learning into a campus like ours, we have 36,000 undergraduate students and about 8,000 graduate students. Is that right, Carl? Something, something like that, about 3,000 professors. So one of the things that we did was we actually went out and talked to the students a little bit about what they wanted to see in terms of digital learning on campus. And what we found out was quite interesting. What we found out was that students are interested, one of the things that came back with is flexibility in time. They want to be able to access material any time of the day. 
<laughs> midnight, three in the morning, whatever it happens to be. We have a lot of students that work at part-time jobs also to pay their tuition. They wanted location and device access. They wanted to be able to access it from anywhere that had Wi-Fi connection or mobile connection, tablets, PCs, smartphones. So they wanted that kind of flexibility. Of course, students want it all. They want everything. They also wanted face-to-face -face interaction with the instructor in class, and they wanted face-to-face um, -face interaction with their classmates, and they wanted all the learning to be meaningful and highly interactive. So a lot of what Marcus was talking about. So how do you take on a task like that? Well, one of the things you have to do is sort of explain to 3,000 academics what exactly these different concepts mean. MOOC, uh, blended learning, face-to-face -face enhanced, web enhanced, these kinds of terms that come up all the time. Everybody knows what face-to-face -face instruction is. I mean, we've all lived through it. It's been around for hundreds of years. And uh, basically, at this end of the spectrum is face-to-face, -face, and at the other end of the spectrum is online. And in between that, we've got um, what we'll call web enhanced, which is basically face-to-face -face instruction in class with additional online materials. Then we have blended learning in the middle here. And this is actually very important because I'm going to press the button here. And what this is, when I talk about blended learning, is actually a reduction in face-to-face -face time while still uh, through online portions, but still keeping the face, still keeping an element of the face-to-face -to -face component. For example, we have models that are a 50-50 split between online and face-to-face, -face, or a one-third, two-third, either face-to-face -face or online, or online, face-to-face, two-thirds, one-third. Then at the other end of the spectrum here, we have face-to-face -face enhanced, which is basically a course that we're going to be running, linear algebra, where the course is all online, but they, students have drop-in sessions where they can come to and get extra help. So at this other end, it's all online here. And if you go upwards, you can see these lines going up by class size. Class size in face-to-face -face environments, there's a physical limitation here on the classroom size. Of course, we can have classrooms as big as 1,500 students. But so it's almost like a class, physical classroom MOOC. And at this end here, class size is basically a techno technical limit. So this is the spectrum that we're using to explain what it is we're actually doing to the professors on campus when we're moving forward. A key part of what we have to do when we're actually moving in this direction is learner engagement. So Marcus talked a bit about that when he was talking about instructional design. So. Student, what we want to do here is maximize, um, optimize the student interaction. Student interaction, student to the content, student to the instructor, and student to student interaction. So it's critical for all three of these areas, face-to-face, -face, blended delivery, and online. And um, all of these, you can have a course which actually runs in all three of these modes, or you can have a course that just runs in one of these modes, maybe online only, or blended only, or face-to-face -face only. Um, we have a hockey course that teaches hockey coaching and hockey, and it's pretty hard to do that one online, but we could actually put some elements of it online, some of the theory and some, you know, a, you know, a little clip from Wayne Gretzky or something like that that says how wonderful Edmonton is. That's where we're located, Edmonton, Alberta. So we had to come up with a strategy I, uh, for our university, and being a large-scale public institution, it's quite as it, many of you know, when you try to transform a large-scale public institution, it's quite difficult to do. So we basically came up with these three key elements here. First one is the research and development component. So what we did was we formed a small R&D group. And I, by small, I basically mean the faculty of education and the faculty of science. We limited everything to those two faculties. They're not small. We have about 3,500 undergrads in the faculty of education and about 800 grad students. For, uh, in the faculty of science, it's probably about 6,000. Carl, is that right? I'm going to check with the provost here to make sure I got the numbers right. And we had a, a joint venture here, so we actually went worked together to combine both um, groups on this R&D project. And we went and we, we sort of looked at what we're going to do as an R&D initiative first around blended learning, around MOOCs, around assessment, which is often left out 
online assessment and better assessment practices, both formative and summative, the way Marcus was talking about it. And of course, we have a new synchronous system, which replaced our old synchronous system that we had from before, which we factored in. Once we come up with good models here of what we're doing, we then have to figure out how to get it all the way over to here, our learning and teaching community, which is students and instructors. And so in between that is um, the Provost Digital Learning Committee, which is basically an oversight committee, which figures out how to take the best practices out of what we're learning here and scale it up to the, whole, to the institution as a whole. And as you can well imagine, there's some real challenges in doing that because uh, just the, even the logistics, when you have a whole university that's set up to deliver face-to-face -face instruction, and even the timetabling when you start to move to blend it, and how you map courses as you reduce uh, time down. If you have a course that's three hours a week, and now it's an hour and a half a week, the, the timetabling scheduling actually becomes quite horrendous, especially when you start to map in exams at the end. So, I can answer questions about that. So let's look at the blended model of instruction. It's a very simple model, but it's actually a very, it's proven to be a very powerful model for us. Um, we use a simple ABA design, which is basically, uh, they do online, they do an element of online first before they come to class. So let's just make this simple, make it a 50-50 split where they do online first and then they come to class and do their face-to-face -face instruction. Now these two are not, they are non mutually exclusive. What they learn online, of course, scaffolds them into what they're going to learn face to face. And what we've done with the online part is we've taken out of the course more of the stand and deliver type of, of things that you'd get in class and move that into the online section. And what we've tried to do in the face to face class, and actually, this face to face part of the course, actually, this has proven very challenging for most of the professors, is make it more interactive in class. And some of them find it very difficult to move from just talking to students to actually engaging with them in a different way. So this, these two are non-mutual exclusive. So a student would do online, face-to-face, -face, scaffold into B, and then return back to A for assignments and review. So I'll share with you a simple, a simple model that from a language and literacy blended delivery model would be existing. We have a lot of pre-existing materials out there in the world online. Students would engage in those. They would do some kind of formative type assessment before they came to class. Then they'd engage in a highly interactive kind of class discussion or interaction um, case study or something like that. We have other models. This one, the curriculum, and we picked a course. We picked for some difficult courses. Somebody mentioned about um, not being able, I think Marcus mentioned about um, uh, first year English. That's actually on our list coming up for a blended delivery model. Uh, curriculum and instruction in elementary um, music education. So here we have activities that they do actually online that scaffold them and get them ready for their in class. This is also a, a simple 50 50 split. And we've made sure that in this case, we're actually developing our own artifacts or digital learning objects that we can share with other people. And they're linked into a curriculum that, like I said before, is scaffolded into the face-to-face -face part. So here I can show you, hopefully this will work, a little example of, uh, this is Professor Amanda Montgomery at um, the University of Alberta. Amanda's quite well known. She's a graduate of Juilliard and Indiana University, and she teaches elementary ed music, and she's an excellent teacher. So here's a good example. Hopefully this will play of what she's done. Welcome back to another one of our recorder how-to videos. This time we're gonna learn two new notes to add to your already G, A, and B. Today we're gonna learn the note C, which is third space on the staff, and D, one note higher, which is fourth line. When you add these two new notes, you're gonna play a lot more new songs, like you're gonna be able to play Bronzel, La Capuchine, a variety of new songs that are in your textbook. So, one of the things that you need to think about, and I have to tell the children this as well, is the kind of way you've thought about fingering up till now has been very logical. You had the G, which was the lowest note you knew, you add, lift one finger up and that's a higher note, and you lift another finger up. But when you go to the C, there isn't any other fingers to lift, although you might think, well, that would be how I play C. So I try to teach the children to think about the C as A with one finger lifted up, because in actual fact, C is fingered with the back 
um, left hand thumb and the second finger. But it's easier for them to think of it as A with one finger lifted up. When I talk about D with the children, I talk about it C with the thumb removed because in actual fact, D is just played that way. So let me play for you the notes G, A, B, C, and D. Here we go. So you see how my fingers try to stay as close as they can. That's something I'm sure you're practicing as you go along with your recorder. Now, what I'd like you to do for a minute is just finger the note C on your recorder. I hope you have that. If you don't have your recorder, just pause the video for a minute. Great, you've got it. Now finger the note D. Just lift it back and forth so that you play something that sounds like this. And you notice that I'm actually using a lot of air. You can tell by my body. I'm using more air for these higher notes because as I told you in the first video, the lower the notes, the less the air. The higher the notes, the more the air. So you can just practice going back and forth. What I'd like you to do with me now is why don't you play G, A, B, C, D, C, B, A, and G. And we'll do it together. One, Two, ready, here we go. You notice my right hand is still down on the bottom of my recorder. Remember in the first video, I said that was perfectly fine just until you get comfortable. If you're feeling a little more stable and you want that right hand to move up where it's eventually going to sit, that would be just fine as well. So enjoy your practicing with your two new notes. You're going to have a chance to play that with the rest of your classmates in your interactive class. But for right now, just see if you can play Bronzel. And Bronzel is easy to play because you keep going just this way with the notes. Here, I'm going to just breeze through here. One of the things that we learned from Amanda from the blended learning clips, and one of the things that we're learning is, is that our students really like what we call YouTube length videos. Five minutes or less. They like these five minute clips, two or three of them, and then some assessments. So like with Amanda's clip, they would do a certain amount of stuff, then they would do, they would do an activity, then when they came to class, they'd scale up to that. We've also, like Dr. Amrine says, um, invented, uh, not invented, developed, um, uh, a MOOC course, Dino 101. We have one of the 14 paleontology departments in the world. We have Phil Curry, who's a leading paleontologist. Uh, Dr. Phil Curry's like the Indiana Jones of sort of paleontology. You know, he's not an archaeologist, but. And uh, we've, we've spent a lot of effort and resources on developing this course. We had Sebastian Theron come from Stanford twice. He gave lectures, plus we sent people down to the machine learning group at Stanford and to Google. Uh, to work with Sebastian's group with Udacity. We built a course that actually didn't go up on Udacity's platform after all, it went up on Coursera's platform. And right now we're running two versions of the course, uh, Paleo 200 and Paleo 201. One is a MOOC only format, it has 20,000 students from the round, around the world, about 400 on campus. They just took their first online assessment that we built an online assessment system, a digital assessment system, and we have 50 students who are taking it on campus in what we call the blended format. What's really interesting is the first day that we announced this course, the blended enrollment filled up before noon and the, before people even started registering in the MOOCs. So I think I'm out of time here. I didn't get you to show, I didn't get to show the MOOC clip that I had here, which is, actually shows the level of interactivity that we've built in, including uh, different kinds of objects to assemble things together and build a dinosaur. We have build a dinosaur in there. We have formative evaluations along the way that Marcus was talking about. We put a lot of instructional design effort into it. So I wholeheartedly agree that you have to do that. Welcome to Dino 101, an online course where you will learn about one of the most fascinating and successful animal groups to ever inhabit this planet. Dinosaurs. Let's talk about dinosaurs in the classical sense. They lived during a period of time called the Mesozoic Era, which started about 250 million years ago. 
and ended about 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs were the largest animals to ever walk the earth, magnificent animals by anybody's definition. The basic arrangement of bones in the body is similar among all vertebrates because they evolved from a common ancestor. Skulls of mammals, like this coyote, only have one fenestrae behind the orbit, located here with this being the orbit. When you move on from this video, you'll have your first experience with your very own 3D fossil viewer. Good work. The same arm bones are present in both humans and Tyrannosaurus. We humans have the same bones in our legs as well. The upper leg bone of Tyrannosaurus rex, which is the same one in my leg, is called a femur. The two lower leg bones are known as the tibia and fibula. If you've ever broken your leg, most likely you broke your fibula. When you leave this video, you'll be taken to an interactive puzzle. You're going to try and build a complete Tyrannosaurus skeleton. Good luck.